Thank you very much uh, for the invitation speaking here. Even I have to say that will not be um, the easiest talk <laughs> after Michael just, but we can put this in perspective, right? And, and, see, and see what this is. So, um, I, yeah, I, I named that thing uh, Building from Waste, um, and that was, is a very straightforward um, narrative story that, that I would like to tell you. Uh, and that is an engagement that uh, since uh, almost four years right now, um, at that time living and working in Singapore uh, in an island state um, that we were approached by the Singaporean government um, at that time working at the so-called Future Cities Laboratory uh, in Singapore to think about the idea of, of um, uh, not using waste anymore to be wasted, meaning in the case of Singapore to be burned, incinerated, and then uh, the remains being used um, to build new islands around the, the island of Singapore, but actually making it um, a positive uh, connotation to waste and seeing potential or starting a research of seeing uh, potentials how to make uh, waste uh, maybe a future uh, building material with all the problematic uh, issues um, that, that were mentioned before. So um, the reason also why we thought then, not only the, the Singaporean government, but also why we thought um, that as architects we should start to think about alternatives. And I think we, we, we heard this this morning, um, how uh, one single uh, construction material, being it uh, reinforced concrete, became the dominant material uh, worldwide. Um, uh, we talk uh, right now about the concrete uh, conundrum. Um, uh, and, and the EPFN Lausanne uh, made calculations if they're right or wrong, doesn't matter, uh, but that every man-made object or more than 50% of all man-made objects today in one or the other way are somehow constructed out of cement. So this, this led us to, uh, to us architects to a kind of a, a stage where, I don't know, a lot of you are teachers, uh, especially at the ETH in Zurich, um, it became a material that was associated also with a certain architectural style, uh, the idea to celebrate concrete um, and, and making the perfect surface out of it became an art in itself. Um, and, and nobody um, questions anymore if, if that is actually the way we should go and if that is the only possibility that we have to construct our um, environment. Um, I would like to show you a small calculation that is actually done by Werner Sobeck, uh, a professor at the uh, University of Stuttgart. And he made a very, very small uh, calculation that he calls the equator wall. And basically he says that, um, and I don't want to go in detail, but basically you can, you can uh, imagine that 125 million people uh, reach every year the age of 16. Uh, and the age of 16 is usually a time in our lives where we start to consume ourselves uh, on infrastructure, where we move out of our parents' house, where we rent our own house, we buy a car, we, we drive on streets, on infrastructure. Um, and that is a, a certain age where all of a sudden um, these 125 uh, million people every year uh, start to consume on our resources um, uh, as we do uh, right now as well. So, just looking at the case of Germany and, and looking at the post-war Germany, he calculates that um, if every one of those 125 million people would consume as much as concrete, um, or reinforced concrete, as the German or average uh, German uh, citizen after the World War, that, that he calculates would be an equivalent to 270 ton per person per year or 13.5 billion cubic meters per year. I mean, that is a number, you can read it and say, yeah, that's a lot or not. Uh, and therefore he came up with that image of the equator wall. So he said if we put that amount of concrete uh, in a wall which is 30 centimeters wide and put that once around the equator of 40,000 kilometers, how do you think how high uh, that wall would be? So I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about that. And uh, what he came up with is that that wall that we have to build um, every year would be 1.125 kilometers every year. If, if all of those young people would consume as much as concrete, as much concrete as, as uh, a typical German citizen did after the World War. Um, I'm showing that because that shows us that um, the way we are going, the status quo, cannot be continued. We, we, we neither have the ability 
uh, in terms of embodied energy. I mean, we don't have to talk about cement and the embodied energy, but we simply don't have the resources for that. Our world does not provide enough material in an earth crust, and I'm talking here about sand, for example. Maybe you heard the story of sand wars, that the resource of sand comes to an end. We, we don't have that anymore to build uh, such an incredible um, uh, mass or volume in the same way as we did. So the research question that we put forward is a very, very simple one. If, 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 we, if we went the wrong way, if we kind of trusted in the singularity of, of uh, reinforced concrete, what are our alternatives? And are we architects part of that question? So do we architects say, well, that's part of material science, that's part of engineering, that is not what I'm interested in? Or do we actually take an active role in the driver's seat of this discussion and discuss possibilities uh, what that could be. So in that situation where we were in Singapore, um, I will present to you uh, what I call three now paradigm shifts. Uh, the first paradigm shift that we were interested in uh, is that waste could be a resource. And uh, to quote Michael uh, Mitchell Joachim, uh, said that the future city makes no distinction anymore between waste and supply. So implementing a kind of a circular thinking that, that the city that we have, the materials that we took out of our earth crust already in an in a age, maybe from this morning's talk I would add, that maybe we are or we were in an age of mining uh, our world and maybe that, that the materials we have should be con considered uh, in a in continuum uh, and not anymore uh, being wasted or even declared as waste. I think these are two different models of the circular metabolism, so not anymore the linear economy that we're trying to follow, uh, but a kind of a circular economy that also uh, Michael, of course, uh, is contributing a lot. So there are two different metabolisms that we can talk about, um, and um, uh, also Michael in the work uh, of, of Gradle to Gradle, of course, talks about the two different ideas um, um, in terms of a nutrient, so one being a natural or a biological nutrient, the other one being a technical nutrient. Of course, when you start looking at this possibility, that's actually when we saw the work of, of, um, of David and Ecovative, um, that all of a sudden new thinking, for example, growing or cultivating your own building material, uh, is playing in the role of this metabolism or this kind of uh, creating a, a nutrient um, in, in the biological sense. And of course, now looking at, at the markets and what is around today, you find a lot of materials, for example, this one being a material insulation material called uh, ultra-touch denim. Uh, it's insulation material made out of old genes. Um, but when you're looking close to this, uh, it sounds perfect in the end, but of course, again, when you're understanding that the, the color or the indigo being used uh, to color the genes, all of that, again, kind of, uh, you're not only recycling the organic fiber of the cotton fiber, but you recycle with it everything that was, of course, um, with it to produce the genes uh, beforehand. Other products here, first, I mean, decoff tiles uh, being produced in Spain. Uh, these designers take um, the, the remains of, of coffee uh, and produce uh, tiles out of them. Uh, they call them even decaf tiles. Uh, you can get them in two variations. One, where, you, where they simply press them into a new form. Uh, they smell like coffee. I mean, when you buy them and unpack them, you have the erosion of a, of, of a, of a, of a coffee um, place. Um, and they, they, you can also get them sealed with, with water glass, where you can use them again in the bathroom um, to, to make sure they don't decay uh, while used in the building. Another one is a, is a very kind of... A, 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 yeah, it's, it's a growing market uh, right now, mostly in Africa. It is a technology coming uh, um, out of, of Europe, of France and from Germany, um, where straw waste, so after harvesting the grain, the remains uh, uh, are actually straw. And, and this company started to take the straw and pressing panels out of it, so similar to a gypsum board panel. You use uh, the straw and you press it with a hot press into shape, uh, and by embody more energy to it, um, to, this, to this organic material. You activate the sugars uh, in, the, in the natural uh, straw home, and the sugars are, are starting to glue together to a certain degree this, this material. Um, it is a fantastic material because you can, you can deal with it almost like a wood. You can drill it, you can cut it. Uh, it has a great thermal um, insulation quality. 
Uh, you also, um, it is fireproof because of its density. And you see here, for example, a project that we did in Ethiopia, uh, because Ethiopia has an incredible amount of that straw that is usually burned on the fields. And here the hypothesis, and I come back to that later on, the hypothesis of this was that we can use this organic material for a certain moment of, or a certain, a certain period of time, um, not to be burned or becoming a, a biological nutrient, but we take that material out of that metabolistic thinking for a certain time, create architecture, a building out of that, and after its use, it comes back into this, into this loop. So you see here students, uh, they build a two-story house. Uh, we use cladding materials that were available in the thing. It is, it is a two-story because we are interested always in the most difficult part, it is the ceiling panels. Um, that, that have to have a certain quality in terms of uh, construction. Um, and then we built a whole series of these houses in Ethiopia, this one being called SEGU, the, um, the Sustainable Emerging City Unit for Addis Ababa, being built out of the straw material. The second circle, um, which is a technical circle, so basically materials which don't fall in the idea of being uh, or organically grown or kind of uh, biologically harvested, but are um, in, in the terminology of gradle to gradle being, being technical nutrients, is a little bit difficult or way more difficult to deal with them. Uh, and I come back later on why it is so difficult right now um, as architects to, to look at these materials and to work with them. One is an example. Um, of a company in Finland, they produce stickers and uh, they did not know for the longest time what to do with the remains of these uh, sticker production. Uh, they have a lot of wax on them, they have a lot of paper on them, and they came up with the idea of producing uh, architectural or structural building elements uh, and invited uh, Shiko Guban uh, to design with their elements, in this case here in, in Mailand, um, for the, for the uh, arts fair and, and pavilion completely being built out of the waste material of their own production. By now you can, you can buy these uh, products I just showed you uh, in every shape and every, in every uh, length. Um, and, and they made basically a second um, economical model out of it by not only producing stickers, but by now uh, equally being successful uh, using their waste product uh, to make these, these building materials. The question at hand is of course, is this a new idea or is this, um, is this even a, a thinkable way? Is this, is this not a downgrading of the original material? And do we simply extend the, the, the one-way road? Or is this a way that we can think in the future uh, of, of um, harvesting our resources from the waste stream? Another product we saw this morning already, the stone cycling from a company in Eindhoven, Netherlands. They take basically the rubble from construction sites uh, they developed a way how to, um, to um, make it not only a product in sense of a construction material, but they're also very interested in the aesthetics of it. So basically producing new tiles and new building materials, new stones, um, by sorting out the rubble in colors, for example, and then um, uh, reselling them um, to the construction market. All of that we put together in a book, uh, which is called Building from Waste where we show all of these examples, but also question at the same time uh, how these materials could think uh, or could be applied uh, in, this, in this metabolistic uh, thinking. The second paradigm shift, um, of course, is not only seeing the, the waste stream, but now putting more intelligence to that, and that, I think, puts us architects again in an active, road, uh, active role to see the building as a material storage for a certain time. With the Ethiopian project, I try to explain how that uh, could be. Um, usually, when we think of um, demolishing or when we think of the end of a building, this is at least in Europe, I don't know exactly here, but in Europe, the way how we demolish buildings. And you can already see that this building is not necessarily a material storage because to sort these materials now in, into different groups, um, is almost impossible and, and if not a, a, a large amount of time and money would be necessary to do so. So the idea now um, is of course if we understand this, the, the, the building as a material resource, it puts us in the design process already in the role to think not only of the construction of the building, but designing it in such a way that in the end of the lifetime we can take every material very easily out of it 
uh, we're calling this building for disassembly. So right now also we're running studios at the ETH in Zurich where we, we test with our students um, if architects are able uh, to do this whole thing. So usually our design process ends in the moment the building is standing there and, and people are moving in, are happy or not happy. Uh, but that is usually the end of our engagement with the building. And here uh, we're testing if it makes sense uh, that, that we simulate uh, already an uh, act that will happen maybe in, in 50, 60, 70 years and how helpful that would be to, to understand um, this one as our design task as well in terms of um, disassembly. We did a project here in New York City last year in the summer of 2015, which was called the, the Zurich Pavilion at the Ideas City Festival, where we tried to simulate that uh, for, for a moment uh, of time. So, and again, we can question the material. Um, that is a, is a material, a waste stream material, which is tetra puck. Uh, you know that in Europe, and I guess also here in North America, um, we have highly sophisticated systems uh, to recycle tetra pucks, so to put tetra pucks again in their three materials, which is aluminum foil, or aluminum, paper, and wax. But in the rest of our world, these high-tech machines are not available. So basically, here is an example from India, where, where Indian people got very invative, uh, inventive uh, with, these, with this material by shredding it uh, and then producing um, tiles or roof tiles out of it um, um, that, that basically are wo completely waterproof, they're rather light, and the huge benefit of them is uh, because of the aluminum foil still being in the material that a lot of radiation that is usually hitting a, a metal uh, element uh, is reflected again uh, to atmosphere and it became a rather successful material to replace the old metal sheets uh, with these uh, tetra pack recycled um, roof tiles. Um, in, in the um, event of the Zurich Pavilion, um, we, um, we took this idea and we found actually, or, yeah, not funny, but um, uh, interesting enough, there's a company here in, um, in the US um, that is doing the same thing. And they are also collecting um, I hope you see this here. They are also collecting um, these tetra pucks um, and they press panels out of them. And the idea of these panels is to replace gypsum boards. And you see here the manufacturer um, of, of these uh, cartons, uh, juice and, and milk cartons, um, shreddering and then you put them into a hot press, you add more embodied energy to it and you get basically these, um, these rather thin, they are 1.5 uh, or 15 millimeter uh, thick panels, um, and together with Philip Block um, from the ETH in Zurich, uh, we came up with a way how to use this material, which in the end does not fulfill any of our standards in, in terms of stability and compression strength or whatever, but by designing or putting design into the, into the main realm, uh, we're able to, to take this rather weak material uh, in a vaulting structure. You see here that, that we cut this piece uh, in, in, with a mill and then brought them to the site here at, at First Avenue and First Street. We rented this, this shop for, for two weeks and you see here we built these triangle shaped uh, elements uh, that, that then were pre, uh, prefabricated in that shop and then just brought over to the site. It's, it's just across the street. You see that uh, brought over. Uh, and then by, by finding the right shape or designing the right shape as a vault and then putting a pre-stress element uh, through this vault. Uh, actually, we saw that this morning with Sheila with a with table that you designed that is the same technique. So you see here the, the ropes hanging. Um, and then putting these elements um, up and putting the rope through, we were able to have that, um, that vault or this kind of event space uh, put up in, in two days, uh, which was therefore I can remember, I think 10 days or eight days um, on the site. So what we test, or what the agreement was with, that, with every company that we worked with here in this project is that they take their material after use back into their regular system. So um, uh, after, the, after the construction was done, you see here how they're put together and then put in, in place. We had to make it watertight as well, so, so the idea of these, uh, of these shindles were one overlapping the other. 
And you see also that the, the, the stands that they were standing on, we also uh, just rented out these pallets, these shipping pallets from a company. Um, actually, in the end, they gave it for, uh, for free to us. Um, So, so here are images of this of the structure um, and, and use. And the, so it took us then half a day to take basically the whole building apart. So the disassembly happened exactly, uh, I think, at, at, at lunchtime. There was the, fa the last event. And at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we started to take the building down. Um, and everything, as I said, went back to the production place where they again shredded the material of the Tetra Pucks and then produced their usual panels out of it again. Um, the truck came to pick up the, uh, the, the shipping uh, boards again. And actually, we, we, we left the site um, with just having the idea that the building was a temporary um, detour of a regular process uh, or, or management um, of materials. And then testing that in the building, of course, the next step, the third paradigm shift is now uh, how the city as such can function then Remember the first thesis that the, the, the city does not distinguish anymore between waste and resource, that the city itself uh, could become a resource. There we're working together right now with the, the city of Zurich, uh, and we're doing a test building for the, for the EMPA, that's the Federal Institute of Material Testing in Switzerland, and they gave the commission to us to build a, a living laboratory, which is called Urban Mining with the idea that with that small test building uh, in Zurich on their, on their campus site, uh, we're working together with the city, and we heard this morning a lot of BIM and a lot of kind of these models that we usually have um, on, a, on a government or urban government, that usually the, 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 gov the, the city knows exactly where our buildings are, they know how high they are, they know how many people are living in there, they even know by now the energy consumption, but they usually don't know which kind and how much materials are stored uh, within them. So here, a, a rather large uh, research project started right now, um, also together with uh, Gerhard Schmidt from Information Architecture at the ETH, uh, to come up with a new data system uh, for the city of Zurich, where in the end, the hypothesis would be uh, that we as architects and engineers and builders um, know exactly the resource already maybe 10 or 20 years ahead of when we want to build a, a new structure in our city and therefore could make them available to a larger market and make sure that that's the, the hypothesis that the city itself becomes a resource uh, is also made uh, an urban governance issue and not only a dream of architects and planners. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you to the GSAPP for inviting me. Uh, yeah, my name's Andrew Dent. I run a library in New York City. Uh, we source innovative materials from around the world to help our clients uh, just make better products and, and spaces. So my job is really just to talk to a lot of different uh, designers, whether they be of buildings or cars or clothes, and to help them think through their material challenges. So given that I talk to an awful lot of people, I thought as part of this presentation what I would do is I would go through some of the industries that we deal with and see how they deal with embodied energy when it comes to materials. The reason why I did this was because I think it'd be nice for you to see the way that different industries actually approach the material problem that they have. Uh, and it's often very differently, and their requirements are different. I did, decided to do it based upon embodied energy specifically, rather than the overall sustainability or, or carbon footprint, because I think what was important to me was to understand the energy required to get the product or material to the to state, to state before it's actually used. So that for me is important, and I actually, and as part of the presentation, I actually talk a little bit about the differences between that amount of energy and then the energy during, during use. So I chose a range of different industries. Uh, obviously, we've already dealt with architecture, that's you guys. Uh, but the other ones I wanted to talk th go, go through and, and kind of get you to understand where they are with materials in terms of embodied energy. So as I said, the amount of energy it takes uh, with their, specifically for, for, for their materials. Okay, fashion, clothing. We all wear it. Uh, it is a massive business. Um, generally, if one thinks about the materials when it comes to fashion, they have a big problem. Even though they can choose materials that perhaps have a lower embodied energy, typically, if in terms of quantitative numbers, uh, it is better to use something like this, which is wool or a linen, than it would be something like a nylon. 
And in general, what we find is that across the board, when it comes to embodied energy of materials, the more processed, the higher the energy. So if you've got a material which doesn't require that much processing, often natural materials tend to be of that uh, form, then typically it has a lower embodied energy than something that requires a lot of uh, synthetic uh, processing. Fashion is a great example of how, unfortunately, all of those challenges just go out the window because we wear what we want to wear. And unfortunately, at the moment, the speed at which the fashion is being consumed means that any attempts to try and, uh, try and improve the overall embodied energy requirement of fashion just fails. It was challenging to be part of the fashion industry, to be part of, you know, whether you are a, uh, a you know, luxury brand or, or, or a big, uh, a, a, a mass market brand. Any attempt you make is the, cha is, the problem is, um, it is very hard to go against the fact that you are making more and more materials. And if we, if we go back to, to Michael's presentation, they need to adopt that sort of thinking because they're only ever going to get worse as the more, th the more successful they are. There are some industries which do a little bit, little bit better. Nike is a good example of how the sportswear industry has really sort of reined in some of its embodied energy uh, challenges with materials. It now understands a lot more about the sorts of materials it uses. It knows, it can tell its designers, okay, you have a toolbox of materials that you should use and you can have trade-offs. So if you want to use nylon, which tends to be relatively high in embodied energy, Therefore, we're going to have to find a better manufacturing process to try and reduce other aspects when you're making that sneaker. So there's a way in which they've assessed it, and there's a little, little bit better control when it comes to, to sportswear and equipment. Consumer electronics. Overall, if you own a PC, material was in, is important. Does anyone still own a PC? Basically, it's something that's on a, on a desktop. Okay. For you, your materials are important because the amount of uh, embodied energy within the materials to make the PC is quite a large amount of the overall energy requirement of that product. It's about 40, almost 50%. So materials are important when you're making it because then, um, because the, the use case, where basically uh, when it starts getting used, that's only another 50%. So improve your materials, you get a very much better return on investment uh, with a PC. When you go down to something as small as a watch or let's, let's say an iPad, it becomes a lot less. So materials become a lot less important in consumer electronics the smaller the, the size of the product, to the point at which what matters more is actually its use. So its efficiency and use is more important than the materials that it's made of. When I was talking to interior designers and understanding the embodied energy of the materials they use, it was interesting because um, there was almost a stark contrast between natural or things like, you know, materials such as wood, and, and marble, and those materials which are relatively unprocessed before they come to, the, to, to an interior, and synthetic materials such as acrylic sheet or those sorts of, those sorts of things. It's interesting that there's a very stark difference. If, you, if you're basically assessing the embodied energy of materials in interiors, natural materials tend to be relatively low, synthetics tend to be a lot higher. And that's, that's really, with interiors, that was a very interesting find for me because I, you know, I always thought that it'd be better to use less material or um, maybe a lighter weight material. But it seems as though that's actually more traditional interior materials have a very much a significantly lower uh, embodied energy when it comes to interiors. Automotive is an interesting change. Um, if you take an average Volkswagen Golf, the amount of energy required to put that Golf together, all the embodied energy of the, of the standard car, is about 15% of its total energy if you use it then for a couple of hundred thousand miles. Okay, 15%. You take an electric car, let's say the e-Golf, and suddenly it goes up to 30%. So your materials become more important. It becomes a larger component of the overall embodied energy of that car during its manufacture and use. If you have to replace the battery, which typically happens in our current batteries, so when you go over, say, 100,000 miles, you have to replace the battery, it then becomes 40, almost 50%. So 50% of the overall embodied energy of, a, of an electric car is actually in the materials used. So it becomes a very important aspect as to what, um, what materials you're going to choose when actually manufacturing that car. Home appliances, as we've seen with energy efficiency processes, its uh, materials become relatively small, uh, as low as 9, even 5% when it comes to an efficient fridge. Uh, the material use is, very, is not particularly important. Energy use is most important. So the efficiency, efficient running of the fridge. So if you're choosing materials for a fridge, it's very important to not to compromise on the efficiency of the running of the fridge, even if the material itself tends to be not necessarily as nice as or as, as uh, I guess, as, as low carbon footprint as another material. If it compromises efficiency, you shouldn't put it in because what's most important here is the run, efficient running of that fridge. Packaging, it's all material. 
material becomes the paramount, uh, uh, the most important aspect uh, when it comes to overall embodied energy, because material is everything with packaging. Chances are you're only going to use it for a very short amount of time. It needs to get from the, the, um, the, uh, the factory to you, and once you've used it, then it's, it's gone. So the use time is relatively small. The material becomes one of the most important aspects. Okay, so that's running through a few different... So those industries think of materials differently than you do. They're interested in materials for different reasons. Often it's efficiency, sometimes, you know, so sometimes it's, it's a material aspect, sometimes it's an efficiency aspect. The second part of my presentation, I kind of wanted to look at, um, I, I talked to Dirk before uh, this presentation, I, and I was listening to the way he was talking about materials, um, waste materials and, and, built, and building with waste. And I thought, okay, given that he's going to be presenting on that, I thought what I would do in response to his presentation is to give you an understanding about if you are going to choose specific materials with the assumption that they're going to be reused, what should you choose? Obviously, uh, Dirk gave some examples of what materials uh, he is experimenting with, but I kind of wanted to give you a, a little bit more scientific approach to the way you should think about materials if you are thinking about repeated use. Not just single, single use and then perhaps reuse, but then multiple uses. Okay, so the materials, I, I basically went through all the material categories, uh, so it'll kind of hopefully give you an understanding of what materials, if in an ideal situation, if you were to choose materials for your building, which ones would be best for actually continual reuse? Okay. And for each example, I've actually got a real material that actually has an interesting story. So this first one, polymers or plastics, um, this material itself is actually called Polyfloss. There's a company that um, will actually uh, take your old plastic, so let's say you've got your old plastic, so uh, let's say the uh, back of this chair, okay, metal. okay so back of a plastic chair, okay. <laughs> Plastic chairs tend to be mostly plastic, let's say a polypropylene, that sort of thing. they've got all sort of glass fiber in them. The glass fiber is used to stiffen it. It's essential to make sure that you minimize the amount of material. So if you're trying to try and recycle that product, the problem is you've got glass fiber and plastic that don't really, you know, so it becomes very, very hard to recycle. This company will put that chair in what is basically a uh, candy floss machine. Um, Okay, oh, oh, sorry, cotton candy machine. Sorry, that's my, my British. Um, Americans, a cotton candy machine with a heater. He basically puts the chair in the cotton candy machine, heats it up and spins it. And what happens is all the glass fiber, and there's a, around the outside, there are holes. So in a cotton candy machine, all the candy comes out of strings. In this machine, all the plastic comes out of strings, but the glass is, is remained in the middle. And they've actually done, um, uh, they, they set up actually in a, uh, a location in a building that was being demolished, and they were taking all of the plastic from them in, in the building and they were basically putting it in this machine and ending up with this material, which we were then, they weren't sure what to do with it. It could be insulation, but it, it shows an interesting uh, alternative use um, for a plastic for something that typically would be very hard to recycle. So polymers, the material in general, you can recycle about five times unless you go through a chemical recycling. So your average, uh, your Coke bottle, your, 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 your chair, as you break it down in traditional recycling processes, it only lasts about five times because your, your, the, uh, the quality of the material reduces. Every time you chop it up, you make it less strong. So polymers in general, like we're thinking of them, the, the, the polymers used in the Tetra Pak, one can use it, uh, uh, recycle it once, and a few more times, then there's a point at which you then have to go through a complete chemical process in order to do anything else with it. So polymers always have a bit of a challenge there. So you want to use it um, a second time, great. You want to use it a fifth time, you start losing the, the performance. You can only really use it as fill. You can't use it as anything structural. Metals. We're always told that metals are infinitely recyclable. I gave the example of this spoon. This spoon is actually from a company called Peace Bomb. They are in Laos, and what they do is they go around and they find, out all, they find all of the exploded ordnance that was dropped on the country, uh, I think during the 70s and 80s. They pick it up, and they melt it, and they basically make it into trinkets and objects. The reason why I think this is interesting, apart from just that interesting story of, of, of creative reuse, is the problem is they do it themselves, and they do it in relatively small casting processes, and the products themselves aren't very good. Because with things like metals, you have to be very careful with the chemistry. You have to be very careful. It is possible to recycle metals repeatedly, an infinite number of times. But the, the challenge is you have to be very careful. It's not something to be done on a small scale. You can't do it like the cotton, the, the cotton candy machine. You need to do it in a refinery. You need to be very careful about chemistry to maintain that good quality. So we can, so metals, yes. We can, can put that into a, into a building. As long as I can pull it out as a solid piece, I can recycle it an infinite number of times. Glass. These are glass tiles made out of old cathode ray tubes. 
Everyone knows what cathode ray tubes are, right? And we're all old enough to know what when te televisions were this deep. Okay, that's th those materials, the cathode ray tubes, you can recycle them. You have to take out an awful lot of the nasty materials, which include lead and uh, lead and that sort of thing. This company can do it. They recycle them and make, it, make, like, make glass tiles. Our challenge currently is that although we can take regular good, say, glazing, and we can recycle it into something like this, as far as I know, we have Old Castle in the room, don't we? As, uh, who was a representative of Old Castle here? Okay, uh, yes. Um, I would love it if you can find a way which, which we can recycle your current glazing into glazing again, because it seems like that's a big challenge. With the buildings that we have, though that glass comes down, it's lot, most of it goes to landfill. I feel like it's, it's still a challenge. I would love to find some way in which th that glazing could somehow end up as more glazing. That, to me, would be a great solve for buildings. That's one material that we're still having challenges with. We've heard about concrete. This one's actually a material called hempcrete. Uh, it's actually using hemp, which they currently can't use in the US because we're not allowed to grow hemp at the moment, so they import it from Canada or from the UK. But the idea being it's an alternative to concrete, but they simply just take hemp, which is a relatively stiff uh, fiber, they cover it in lime, and you end up with a building material which requires z almost zero energy when it comes to, um, when it comes to production, very low embodied energy uh, material. Concrete, I think, is still a challenge. I think, you know, I think Dirk mentioned, you know, how, about, you know, how do we move beyond concrete? It's tough because it's, you know, it's, it's a high performing material, it is uh, effective, it can be poured almost anywhere. So alternatives to concrete are still going to be a challenge. But I still, I think we do have, there are some alternatives, I'm not suggesting this is going to suddenly be the material that's used in all of the skyscrapers going up in, in New York City, but I think we do definitely need to look at more lower embodied energy alternatives. Composites was also mentioned. Now, okay, the reason why I put this material up rather than a carbon fiber is because this has, not quite, but almost as much strength as a carbon fiber. That is flax, so it's basically linen, and the binder itself is a bio-based bio binder. So the concern about not being able to recycle composites, those carbon fibers, yes, I know that's a challenge. There are some developments more recently where you can actually recycle um, composites, but it requires a specific type of binder. But the majority of you can't. This, however, this has the, op the opportunity to go into a biological nutrient. So it, has the, it is basically bio, it is bio based. So rather than being a technical nutrient, which is typically what a composite would need to be, because this is, um, uh, is a bio based binder as well as, as flax, it has the potential to then become uh, a biological nutrient. So therefore, used again, um, not necessarily recycled specifically, but still within that, that process. Seaweed. Uh, um, I think. For me, this is interesting uh, because when we talk about embodied energy and everyone talks about, uh, well, you know, we're currently using plastics, why can't we use bioplastics? One of the biggest challenges we have with plastics when we talk to our clients is that, uh, A, they, in general, they tend to have as big a carbon footprint or a bigger embodied energy as regular plastics. The other challenge is often the resources we use, which is corn, tends to be from arable land. And a lot of our clients don't want to use it because they're concerned. I mean, IKEA is a good example. IKEA uses an awful lot of plastics. They would love to use bioplastics, but they won't use corn because they don't ever want to be uh, accused of taking food out of people's mouths, which is what the use of arable land would do. So that's why I love algae or, or seaweed, because it has the potential to be used, um, to be grown in, almost in an industrial process. And I think the future of a lot of our bio-based materials should be through industrial processing. I think the, the sort of traditional harvesting of materials the way we, we do, I think that has challenges because we only have a certain number of, of uh, square acre, acreage on the planet. This algae can be actually produced and, 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 and used whether it's for, um, whether it's actually for, uh, for, for building cladding as a photovoltaic, adding into plastics, that sort of thing. It can be made in large stainless steel vats in the Nevada desert. It doesn't need arable land to do so. Lignin is always an interesting one. Uh, of all the, the cellulose that we make out of trees, so think about the, um, the, the, the other material that's left after, you made, uh, after you've made paper um, out, of, out of wood, is lignin. It's a pulpy material. It can actually be manufactured into plastic, so it's an, an excellent alternative use um, for that waste material. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to leave you with one example. And I, I, you know, I think um, you know, we, we heard this morning from Eben about... Um, about the ecovative material. And I think the reason why that resonates for us so much, and certainly for me, is that when we talk about embodied energy, that material, the mushroom material, it's not just that it's a natural material, not just that it has performance properties that have the potential to get up there with, as an alternative to styrofoam. It's that in terms of embodied energy, it's virtually zero. 
You just let nature do what it wants to do. I think that's what's so exciting about it. It's using nature, rather than taking nature and then synthesizing it, as I said, with the bioplastics often use as much carbon um, as regular plastic, because you have to work them. The, what I love about the, uh, the mushroom material is that it's you using, letting nature just basically go its normal path. So I think that for me is very inspiring, very exciting, and using biological processes the way they want to be used. Not fighting against nature, but working with it. And I think that is the way we need to think about our approach to biological materials, is when you think, okay, how is nature moving forward? We need to follow that path, because fighting against it is just gonna give us a greater embodied energy when it comes to um, uh, um, synthesizing it and making something useful. This is the one I'm gonna leave you with, because not always does the idea of letting nature take its own uh, route uh, a successful one. This is a guy, there's a guy in the UK who had a, a great idea of manufacturing wood chairs out of wood, but basically having them grow. So what this is, is this is a frame around which, so he has a, a tree which grows, and he has a frame, and he basically bends the, the wood around to basically eventually come into the shape of a, tree, of, of a chair. The idea being that you've just grown a chair. Great idea. Great idea because, again, it's, using, it's letting nature use its natural processes. It takes time, but you have enough of them, eventually you end up with, with, with a great chair. This is what he hoped it to be. <laughs> nice chair, nice and thick, uh, you know, very stable. This is where he's at at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I love his energy. I love that he's doing this. But nature doesn't always want to do exactly what you, what you want it to. And I think I want to leave you with that because we still have a lot of work to do when following nature and, and using its processes. But I think this is a good example of, like, we're getting there, it's just we're not quite there yet. So, so thank you. You talked about concrete. You talked about how we need to move to an alternative to concrete. Is there, you know, showed some excellent examples, is there, is there yet a viable alternative to concrete? Is there, you know, or what would that, what do you see that material being? Yeah, I think there, there are a couple of uh, alternatives to concrete. It is just a question of what is our standard and what do, what do we want as architects and how do we design? I mean, for the longest time, and. I was in architecture school. I mean, the, the, the process we designed then or even today is that um, we usually come up with a design, a form, and only in the very, very end we ask ourselves, so what is the material I'm going to realize this with? And funny enough, in 98% uh, of the cases, the answer is concrete. <laughs> so it became almost a, a kind of a paradigm for us that we say, yeah, we don't even think about anymore what is, what is the use, oh, sorry, what is the, what is the material that kind of guarantees us the use of that building. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when we reverse this, right, and when we start looking, and very much today we talked about location and the context, and we look at that, and first look at our palette that is available, I think all of a sudden our designs become informed by the possibility of the material that we have and not what we would like it to be. Mm -hmm. And therefore I think that is, a, that, is, that is in our hands, right? We don't need anyone else. There's a question of design. And, mm -hmm. and what I like about that is that, that that all of a sudden puts us architects in a very important role again, right? So that we, that we can, that is, that is our domain. We mm -hmm. are experts in design. Mm -hmm. And therefore, making that part of our, of our, of our daily work again, uh, that is where the alternative to concrete starts mm -hmm. to, to right. become very, very important and very, very um, let's say, for me at least, very pleasurable to work with and, and to think about. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a, a, that's a great example because I work with clients, not, not necessarily architects, but people who make products um, every day. And we're continually telling them that, that if you just design and then choose a material afterwards, you'll end up with a similar product, often with some of the challenges, that you, you know, the same challenges you had before. If you think of the material first, or at least at the same time as you're coming up with the, with the concept, it completely changes the way of, you, um, of, of thinking about, about, yeah, so the, if you can, just because concrete's been used doesn't necessarily, so that's the way the, the buildings have ended up looking like. Yeah. If you choose a different material, maybe they look different, just because, so you see that also in, um, let's say, uh, the design of, of, of bikes, um, road, uh, uh, racing bikes. When they first used carbon fiber, they tended to follow the same way that they'd be manufactured using steel. Yeah. So the first ones tended to be like quite, quite blocky. Now you see them, they're using carbon fiber in the way it likes to be used, which is smooth curves. Yeah. So yes, I think often a change in material requires a change in thinking to think about you know, what does the material want to do and how does it best perform. Yeah. And I think a lot of that knowledge actually was around for the longest times, right? But, but because of, um, Forrest mentioned that the last 100 or 120 years of the, re the kind of um, invention of the reinforced concrete, 
um, we, we somehow forgot how, how these things work together. And, and uh, to come back to what Michael said, I mean, um, we also do a lot of research, for example, in, in earth architecture and in, in earth and uh, building. And funny enough, the question of climate in, in these buildings is not an issue, right? Because um, the material itself or the construction uh, material, the, the way how you construct with that material is taking care of a lot of, of other questions um, that we only built into our designs with the wrong choice of materials. Mm -hmm. So for me, right now, working on these alternatives, and we do a lot in, in different fields. Um, this morning was also mentioned bacteria. We are very much interested in bacteria as a new, as a new kind of adhesive, um, mm -hmm. uh, what you just mentioned as, as a resin or a biological resin. I think there are also other possibilities of, of making, making natural processes uh, very productive for the idea of, of architectural construction. And that at least make uh, my heart uh, to beat a bit faster and, and uh, <laughs> uh, coming up with new ideas, even so if we don't succeed, right? I think a lot of failure is in this, in this research. But um, um, as she meant the morning, you, sometimes you just throw things out and, and the most important thing is the boomerang coming back and, and the learning that you got from that. And maybe you only solve it in whatever, 25 years or never, but at least there is, there is a passion behind it. Um, we talk about embodied energy. Uh, I think also our energy is important in our profession and, and, and how we deal with these questions. I got one more question. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I love the idea that you can have within a city uh, buildings as storage. Okay, so do you see that as something that is, um, you know, could it, is it, going to, is it going to be government driven or is it going to be free market driven? Do you see that as basically just a free trade of, of materials between buildings or do you think it's something that needs to be organized by the government in order to make sure that there's a fair, uh, fair trade and that, and that, that um, uh, regulations are, are, are kept up? Yeah. Do you see, like, have, you, have you thought through what some more... Yeah, we, that are? yeah, we discussed a lot with that, also with the city, because um, see, the, the, there's a very simple, a very simple thing in the end: is the data available to everybody or only to a certain group of people? So let's say from now on, you know, in, in, in 20, 30 years, we know exactly how much materials in which building and which site and stuff like that. Let's say it's a given. So who 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 owns this knowledge? Right? That that is that is the crucial question. So do you make that as a public domain? Is this something that you and I can share? Right? Do you have a library and you say, well, if you want to have more of this material, you can go to site X, and you know, in three years they are going to demolish the building, and you can bid for this material, and maybe you get the stuff. That that would be the way how we would like to see it. We also work together with a group in in Brussels called the Gotua. And, and they are already doing that right now, but, but they are missing exactly this information. So what they do is usually um, they get knowledge that a building is demolished, and then they move in before the, the big machines come, and they take everything out that is for them sourceable, right? Mm -hmm. And put it into either a storage, but that is the, the, the smallest time, but they start to selling off already on the site. So they invite other people to come uh, and, and bid for the material on site, mm -hmm. so they don't have to even store it, but, but it is in a kind of material flow and not anymore as a, as, a, as a myth of where these materials are and, and mm -hmm. where they are stored and where they are gone. So to answer your question again, I think that is decided by, by in the end, by a political decision, right? Is this a, a, a data set that is uh, mm -hmm. uh, available to everybody mm -hmm. or only to a certain group of people? I hope for the first, of course. Of waste is a good one because, you know, we do run into difficulties when trying to organize new systems. There's a lot of you know, reluctance, there's a lot of economic difficulty and so forth, and that is the fundamental um, difficulty with the two different cycles, you know, how to actually implement them, how to actually make that move from theory to practice. But I suppose that some of the work um, that we've seen, like coming out of London, I'm thinking about the kind of itinerant machines of, of Swine Studio and others, suggests that the kind of um, DIY um, manufacturing of materials, which is sort of very personal, could be done with portable machines so that individuals could harvest plastic directly or harvest aluminum or whatever it might be, smelt it down um, or extrude it into filament for making 3D prints. So I think that it's not necessarily um, at the scale of the governmental. There may be a way in which sort of individuals could also intervene in, in waste streams. Yeah, I, I agree, but therefore it is also necessary that, um, that we have to change the way how we think about materials. Um, lately, I don't know if you know this example, I hear a lot about the possibility to turn a, a PET bottle into a sweater. Right? 
The problem is a PET bottle was never designed, or the chemicals putting in there was never designed that you put this on your skin. So there must be either that every material that on a personal level we, we kind of make a resource again is completely sure that there is nothing in there that could harm our environment, our plants or our human beings. Uh, that's one possibility, or we make sure that the materials that we reharvest never change their purpose. So whatever was designed as a, as a certain product should stay in that line of products and not all of a sudden becoming clothing for for infant or for for human being. I think that is the difficulty. That there's still a lot of work uh, has to be done. Here again, of course, I would like, and, and therefore I follow Michael completely. Uh, and therefore we need also the help of, of maybe chemists to come up with a range of material that we can say in the future, you know, it doesn't matter if I make a bottle out of it or a sweater, right? Because the material, you know, allows for that. That would be the perfect world. But uh, unfortunately there we are still quite some mileage to go. The question is to Professor Hoffmann. Uh, Hebel. This is regarding the decaf tiles, the, the strotter and uh, certain other pelt crate and uh, similar materials. What, what should change from uh, the usual practice today for these things to become mainstream in construction? Thank you. Um. Actually, it doesn't, you see, the thing is, that these, these products I showed today are commercial available, right? So if you would like to use, for example, the decaf tile, you simply order them. That's, that's possible. For me, it becomes interesting on now, I guess you're an architect or designer, it becomes questionable for us, how do you use that tile? I guess the moment you put a regular motor, right, on, on that tile and put it onto the wall, you could also have bought any other tile, right? Because again, you create a system that is not being ready for disassembly after the use of that tile. Again, it needs us designers now to come up with a, with a system, a construction system that allows me or you in 10 or 15 years to go into your bathroom and taking that tile and it is still in the same state as we put it in. Right? So the product, the material is not enough. It needs behind that, needs a whole logic of thinking of constructing what we call building for disassembly to make sure also that, that the taking out and maybe recycling, whatever you would like to do, is actually possible. And I think that is a, a, a large field for us architects to think and innovate. What is your strategy to go back into uh, components instead of materials? Because when, when you have a mobile phone, for example, the real material value is less than $2, basically. But if you could recapture components, actually, then you could come up up to 60 or 70 percent of the yes. value of the product, yeah. basically, with that. So, what is, do you have a strategy for that? Um, what we are trying right now is to actually hook up with the industry uh, to think um, architecture not as we usually do, as uh, putting materials to the construction site and then putting each material up on on the site as is. But I think also for the future, we have to think a lot in pre-manufacturing. So why don't we think in components, or we call them modules, uh, that, for example, we are planning right now uh, 140 uh, social housing components for a, for a social um, housing company in Zurich. And for them, it's important that when uh, family um, shifts happen, so right now how they build is, or the, the, in the case we're investigating is, these social flats were built 100 years ago. Uh, and in Zurich, you know, the building stock is rather long, long term. In these hundred years, um, the social structure of the family completely changed. So what they would need right now would be apartment sizes between three, four, and five room apartments. A hundred years ago, they built one, two, and three room apartments. So they would be interested right now when they build or replace the buildings themselves that this is based on a modular system, on a component system that they could say very easily for them, they could change the building also during the 100 year lifespan um, in, in a matter of days to accommodate for different social structures of, of their family. Plus, they are also interested because usually they don't only have one site in the city, they have several sites, to move components and modules across the city with different ideas. And also in Singapore right now, that is a, a new way to go. The government right now in Singapore is aiming to build 80 story high buildings out of modules, of prefab modules that then after 10 years, 15 years can be re relocated and reshifted 
uh, in the city. So I think the thinking goes there. So not only material, but larger uh, elements that, that are flexible enough for future uh, change. Um, the ultimate in recycling of concrete is the uh, reconstruction of Interstate 80, which in, I drove in 1990, which was completely torn up. The concrete was reused and then replaced. So one wonders, 25 years later, are they doing it again? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's actually true. That's, that's a sad story of concrete, that uh, when you recycle concrete, usually um, the, the material char characteristics change. So the compressive strength of recycled or, or partially recycled concrete is usually not as high as a, as a, um, a, a new mix. And therefore, funny enough, uh, the only use so far for, for recycled concrete is in, in uh, infrastructure pro uh, projects, where we put it actually as a, as a base for, for new construction. There is a large research right now, uh, I know in France and in, in Switzerland, that they came up with an idea of, of um, using the recycled concrete um, to, they claim, even had, having better material characteristics than the original one. But that requires, again, and we come to a lot of chemistry that is going in there. So in the end, you have a product that maybe fulfills higher standards in terms of compression strength, but then becomes a time bomb when you think of the, the second, third, and fourth recycling process that you're putting in there. So therefore, uh, for me, we talked about com uh, composites. In the end, um, concrete is also a composite. And therefore, we should maybe shift our thinking a little bit away from these, from these composites. Um, I, I think we're almost ready to wrap up, but I did want to um, just note that I think it was interesting that, um, you know, as we're uh, wrapping up these panels and getting ready for the keynote, that it's, uh, I think, fitting for, for you, Dirk, to look for opportunities for us to return to design um, and opportunities for design and the kind of strengths and expertise of designers. And along those lines, I, I just had one thought and then, and then a question for you, Andrew, which is, um, you know, it's sometimes said that a, a clever move for an architect is to tell their client a story that the client would want to repeat, you know, to their friends about the project when the architect isn't around. In other words, you kind of, you can't be too complicated, you can't win them over with things that they wouldn't be able to, you know, digest and get behind themselves and tell the story of themselves. I'm wondering if you have any um, any stories that you know that you tell your clients from from any industry really that really resonate with them that that is something that they you know want want to tell back that they understand because I I think when we're you know combining this idea of metrics and stories you know even if our secret goal is the is the metrics. We need people to get behind the stories, right? So I wonder if you have any examples of that. Yes, I mean, um, I, th I think whether it's uh, automotive, whether it's, it's fashion, which, whichever industry it is, I, I think the stories are key. And the stories, I think, are um, they need to have two aspects. I think they need to have an aspect of um, uh, sort of insider knowledge. I think you know if you can you know if there's a material that only you can use or a material that has a specific uh, prior use that has great value. I think the second thing is um, people do also love to think that they love to love the idea of sustainability. So often we found that one of the most effective ways to get people on board with reducing their environmental impact is to actually have an interesting story behind it. The numbers will never actually give you. Um, some, you will never actually get someone to, to, um, to really want to own it. So although we always have to go through the metrics to make sure that the, that the material solution is going to be um, a, a lower, lower impact one, often the only way we can get them to actually go on board is to actually tell them a story about how they're actually going to be improving the world in some way. So you know, it's, it's a relatively simple thing. Um, and that I think we all, you know, we all like to feel like we're doing a small, a small part. And I think those, uh, the sustainability stories need to be ones in which I think uh, resonate on a more personal level. And the reason why I, what I say about that is um, when it comes to sustainability, it's amazing how ineffective telling, you, telling someone that they're going to save the planet is compared to they're going to make the, the room in, uh, in a, in a, in a, a make, make a child's room cleaner. 
there is a, a resonance there which is much more um, sort of close to home and is effective. So whenever talking about sustainability, we tend to avoid the large four metrics that you're going to save the planet because that becomes something just un un not understandable. If you can, get, you can bring it down to something where someone says, okay, I will be able to make sure that this baby's life will be healthier, that is, is always effective. People will pay more for that and will work harder for that than they would for, unfortunately, saving the planet. Great. Well, thank you both.